It's the amazing Rico Bronia podcast with your host, Evan Roberts. Let's all count together now. One series one, two series one, three series one in a row. How does it feel? The New York Mets take two out of three against the Kansas City Royals. It is now three consecutive series victories. It was not easy. No one is going to lie to you and tell you that it was, especially on Sunday where the offense had so many opportunities to break through and hand runs to Jose Buto, and they were unable to do it. But the Mets, on an infield hit, on a bases loaded walk, and on holding on for dear life, win yet another series, defeating the Kansas City Royals two out of three. We celebrate the retirement number-wise of Doc Gooden. And so overall, very, very good weekend if you're a Met fan, a lot to get to. We will break down all three games. I'll give you my thoughts on the Doc Gooden retirement ceremony. It was certainly in the building on Sunday. We got a lot of emails to get to, the reaction to Francisco Lindor, uh, and the crappy attendance. Those are all on the menu on today's Rico Brilliant. But let me start with the fact that the New York Mets have done something that I don't think coming into the season we really figured this. Because I think when you looked – at the schedule to start the year. And you saw the Brewers coming off of an offseason in which clearly they took a step back. They went out and traded one of the best pitchers in baseball. A series against Detroit, certainly a team with better expectations, but who knows how good they are. Yeah, the Reds can be tricky. Yeah, the Braves are really good. And then Kansas City coming off a year in which they lost over 100 games. I think you all, myself included, looked at that schedule and said, hey, that's a soft schedule. And what's funny is now, you know, 15, 16 games into the season, certainly a small sample size, all of those teams are playing well. I mean, think about it. So losing all three to Milwaukee is still bad, but the Brewers are 10 and four. Losing two out of three to Detroit, not ideal. The Tigers are nine and six. The Cincinnati Reds, who the Mets won two of three from last weekend, nine and six. The Atlanta Braves, you know how good they are, nine and five. And even the Kansas City Royals, who the Mets just took a series from, still with an overall record of 10 and 6. So who the Mets have played, I think, feels a little bit different than maybe what we imagined at the beginning of this season, especially Kansas City. I mean, I know the Royals went out and added veterans, and we certainly got to look at kind of the different look of the Kansas City Royals over the last three days. But did any of us think they're going to come out and get off to a great start? And they certainly have. And what was very, very impressive was going right back to the beginning of this series because there were a few things right out the gate that had to make you feel very, very good as a Met fan. Number one, hitting Michael Waka. Because for whatever reason, Michael Waka's brief time here in 2020, a year we try to make believe never happened. Waka was a failure here, but has now gone out over the last three years and has turned into a very reliable, solid rotation piece. And the Mets did a very good job against Michael Waka. Brandon Nemo with that big RBI double in the third inning. They strung the four consecutive hits together in the fourth inning after Pete Alonzo grounded into a double play. Brett Beatty, who continues to be tremendous, hit the RBI double in the fifth inning, and the Mets were able to tack on against Michael Waka. And I think that was nice to see. It was good to see this offense after what they did in Atlanta because the Met offense was awesome in those three games in Atlanta, and they backed it up in the opener of this series. I don't want to say it would be a letdown, but you could kind of see a letdown. After winning a series against the Atlanta Braves, you're taking on a Royal team in front of an empty crowded city field. More on that later. And the offense continued to be its feisty self. Even at Pete Alonso tacking on a home run on an 0-2 pitch, which is always impressive. But the other thing that was great to see in the opener of this series, and this is the guy I was most excited about coming into the year as a bounce back candidate, was the performance of Luis Severino. Luis Severino pitched with confidence, he threw with conviction. And other than that home run he gave up to Salvador Perez, and he actually got hit hard in the first inning, but got through it. It was a one, two, three inning with a lot of hard contact. Severino walked those back to back hitters in the second, and it felt like the game could get out of hand. And it felt like the beginning of this game could turn into another ugly or mediocre performance by Luis Severino. And he got a couple of big outs and then went into overdrive. And pitched very, very well. Ran into a little bit of trouble in the fifth inning where he walks back-to-back guys in front of Bobby Wood Jr., which is not a good idea. And Seve gets that huge swinging strikeout to get through five innings. Granted, 
I think we'd all love to see more than five innings, but beggars can't be choosers with this rotation at points. You give me five innings, you allow only one hit and one run. You work through some back-to-back walk spots. That's a good performance by Luis Severino. And it was backed up by a Met bullpen that overall this season has pitched very, very well because they asked this bullpen to go out and get 12 outs. But luckily, the Met offense was able to tack on a little bit. Jake Diekman did a fine job. How good is Reed Garrett, by the way? You know, we, we always talk about how during the offseason, you look at a bullpen, and there's going to be a guy that you least expect who's going to burst onto the scene. If you're a good team, that is. I mean, if you're a crappy team, maybe none of this happens. But if you're a good team, it's going to be a guy out of your bullpen that you're not even thinking about. And that guy's going to contribute in a big way. And so far, small sample size alert, but so far, how about Reed Garrett? Reed Garrett has earned a spot in this bullpen. He got four outs in the game on Friday, and the Mets were able to actually not even have to go to Edwin Diaz. And they put themselves in that tricky spot on Friday and Saturday where, remember a week ago, Edwin Diaz was overworked, and the Mets had to try to win games knowing they couldn't use Edwin Diaz, specifically the first game of the Atlanta series. Here we are five days later, and you're debating, do we go to Edwin Diaz because he never pitches? Because the Mets have been in situations where they haven't needed their closer. And you know what side I err on when it came to that decision on Friday, even though I'm you know debating this five hours after the game was over because I was on extreme DVR, more of that a bit. I err on the side of don't use your chip. Don't use them. Because even though you want to keep Edwin Diaz fresh, and this is the opposite of pitching a guy too much. You don't want the guy to sit for a week and a half. What if you're in a spot where you've got three or four straight save situations? We'll think back to the Friday night with a six to one lead where Carlos Mendoza said, screw it. I'm just going to throw Edwin Diaz because he needs work. So I like the fact, and I'm trying to remember if he was warming up on Friday night. I think he was. He was definitely warming up on Saturday and they didn't use him. But I like the fact that Carlos Mendoza said, you know what, screw it. Let me just get the three outs from Jorge Lopez. Let me keep Edwin Diaz fresh because you never know when you're going to have to use a guy a bunch of days in a row. So it was a good win on Friday night. I was stunned because on Friday night, I had a book signing in Queens, like literally three miles away, four miles away from City Field in my old stomping grounds of Long Island City. And it was a fun event with Tiki for about two hours from 730 to about I guess we were finished at about 9.15. And, you know, most of the people, they're Mets fans. I mean, they're buying my Mets Bible, so I assume that they're Mets fans. And I said, do me a favor. Can nobody spoil the Met game? Because ideally, in a perfect world, I'd like to get home, you know, 10 o'clock, whatever time it is, sit down, score the game, and watch the game. And stunningly, even in a partisan Met crowd, not one person told me what was going on in the game. So kudos to everybody that showed up. First of all, thank you for showing up. I'm honored and humbled by that. But thank you very much for not spoiling the Mets game and not even spoiling the Knicks-Nets game. And I'm glad you did because in the Nets-Knicks game, you would have told me, yeah, Nets are up by 20. It feels good. Meanwhile, we all know what happened. Or if you don't know what happened, uh, they lost and the Knicks won. So thank you for not spoiling Friday night's game. But I'll tell you one quick thing about that that was very tricky. So I'm leaving Queens. I'm driving back to where I live in Westchester, and I have to pass City Field. It's just the route I take. So I'm on the Whitestone Expressway. And if you've been on the Whitestone Express, actually, no, I switched off into the Van Wick. So I'm on the Van Wick getting onto the Whitestone Expressway, and you pass the outfield at City Field. And I'm doing so. Event ends at 9.15. I'm doing so at about 9.45. So I'm like, I got to just look straight. I can't even veer off and look at the stadium because you never know that one second of looking at the stadium, I may I may get something. Something may be given away. And so I'm looking straight ahead, and in the corner of my eye, I see the LED lights flashing, just flashing. And now my brain's working overdrive. Ah, it's 9.45. It's two and a half hours into the game. Edwin Diaz must be coming into this game, which in my brain is like, oh, that's a good thing. means we have a lead, or maybe it's not a good thing. Carlos Mendoza feels the need to pitch him. So I'm watching this game in the back of my mind thinking Edwin Diaz is going to pitch because I saw in the corner of my eyes the LED lights. Now, looking back at things, I think it's very possible the game was over. I think that's possible. And the other thing that's possible is maybe it was when Pete Alonso hit the home run in the eighth inning. 
So that's how sick I am, ladies and gentlemen. That's how nuts I am. But good win to set the tone, to, to kind of build off of what happened in Atlanta and put yourself in a spot where all you've got to do is split between Saturday and Sunday and win the series. As far as Saturday is concerned, Saturday is one of those days where, look, the offense showed a lot of fight, and you give them credit for that, but Sean Manaya just was so awful. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, Sean Manaya was the worst we've seen of him after getting off to such a great start. You know, he gives up that run in the first inning. He runs into trouble in the second inning when he issues the back-to-back -back walks, including walking Lofton with the bases loaded. He gives up the hit to Salvador Perez ahead of the count. And what was so frustrating about all this is the Mets are fighting back each time. They're down one nothing. They come back. They make it three to one. Then Kansas City scores the three runs. It's four three. Mets come back in the third inning. Pete hits a home run behind in the count again, which has been a common theme for him. Ties the game up at four. Then the Royals just you know all over Sean Manaya in the fourth inning and the Mets' inability to a throw anybody out trying to steal which is a major issue. I mean, Omar Narvaez is behind the plate. It's, look, it's a reminder that Narvaez is a bat first option. At least that's the way he's played so far earlier this season. They run at will on the Mets. And then, then you've got Starling Marte, who I don't want to kill. I think Marte's been fine so far to start this season. But one out, nobody on in the fourth inning. The game changed when Starling Marte dropped the fly ball. You know, Bobby Witt Jr., who is such a good young player, hits a fly ball to right field. If Marte makes the catch, you know, there's two outs and nobody on. Think about it that way. In a tie game, a game that you just tied. So it's no excuse for what happened next because Sean Manaya then implodes. He gives up the base hit to Lofton. He gives up the home run to Salvador Perez that went off of Brandon Nimmo's glove. He gives up a base hit ahead of the count to Garrett Hampson. He's finally chased from the game. And obviously things got work because Cole Sulser came in and gave up another run. But... It's another example. It reminded me of that game earlier this season, the Severino game, his first start against Milwaukee, where there was one defensive miscue by Zach Short, and it felt like it changed the game early. That's the way the Marte play felt. So am I putting the whole game on Starling Marte? I'm not putting the whole game on him, but the game changed. And let's just be honest. Three base error with one out and nobody on in the fourth inning completely changed the game. And it put the Mets in this spot now where even though it's still early, they're down eight to four. They're still chasing runs, even though the offense got off to a really good start in this game. But again, they showed fight. Even when Cole Sulser gives up a couple of runs, even when they give up two more in the sixth inning, even when they're sitting there getting, let's face it, killed, they're down 11-4 and the game is essentially over, the Mets fight back. and. No one has said this, but I want to preemptively attack a point that I hear a lot of people make sometimes, usually about players they don't like. They say, and I'll use Pete Alonso's home run in the sixth inning as a great example, even Starling Marte's in the eighth inning. Pete Alonso had a home run in the sixth inning with the Mets down 11-4. It made it 11-5. And what I've always heard about guys who fans don't like is, ah, meaningless home run. That doesn't mean anything. What bothers me about that opinion is that maybe in the moment it felt meaningless, but what if it's the beginning of a rally? And we ended up seeing that with the New York Mets, where they were a batter away from getting the tying run to the plate. So for anyone who looks at Alonzo's two-home run game in the loss to Kansas City on Saturday and says, ah, that second one, that don't count. Nah, it was a blast. It's a meaningless home run. There are very few home runs that are meaningless. Now, you want to tell me there's a, a 13th to two game in the bottom of the eighth inning and you're up and someone hits a home run. Okay. I mean, there are, I guess a few, but I don't look at that home run in the sixth inning. And by the way, I'm not, there's no one who has said it. So I know I'm attacking the boogeyman right now. Like there's no one I'm calling out. It's just in general, that's like a thing that annoys me. And when Alonzo hit that home run, it started going off in my head of, Oh, I could see this being called a meaningless home run, but it's not. Makes it 11-5, and we saw the Mets ended up rallying and at least making things interesting. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That, that, that's something about baseball, and I used to be very critical of Alex Rodriguez, you know, padding his stats when he didn't need to. But I will say this. If you if you say that a home run like that is meaningless, that basically everything that happens in that game to a losing team is meaningless, right? I mean, it, they lost. So none of those stats really matter because at the end of the day, they didn't win the game. 
By the, by the way, you hit on something, and this is, I guess, the way my brain works with that. If the Mets are up 13-2, to two, or in Alex's case back in the day with the Yankees, they have a big lead late. Those are the ones, the tack-ons, when a game is out of reach, those are the ones that feel like meaningless or feel meaningless. When you're losing in a game, because I have this, this feeling, and it's part of why I love baseball so much, that you're never really out of a game. There's no clock in baseball. I know there's a pitch clock, but you know what I mean. There's no clock in baseball, so you're never really out of a game. So even on Saturday when they're down 11-4, like, I'm still watching. I'm still thinking, hey, you never know. So a home run in the sixth inning that makes an 11-4 game, an 11-5 game, doesn't feel meaningless because you're trying to come back. You know, you're trying to make the game close. But let me just say this about Pete as I'm grabbing my long-ass hair and my long-ass beard in honor of Pete. Both of those home runs on Saturday behind in the count. Both of those home runs just laser beams. So Pete Alonzo, and this is the funny thing about early in a season, you can change your stats, good or bad, real quick. So Pete Alonzo, not that long ago, was sitting there with an average on the interstate. And after a three for three, two home run, three RBI on base four times game, including a great at bat in the eighth inning, which I'll get to in a second. Pete Alonso made his numbers look very, very good. But the Mets again in this game on Saturday, they showed fight. And I'm not trying to call it a moral victory, but they were in the game. Now, I will tell you what annoyed me. It was the first time all year because I'm a very patient guy. I'm a very, very patient guy. I believe you got to give guys time. Back of the baseball card, everybody's going to be fine. That doesn't mean I'm not human. Considering the way the Mets fought in this game, and I mentioned Alonzo had this nine-pitch at-bat in the eighth inning as they were rallying and they chased Matt Sauer where he faced the three-batter minimum and they got him out because the Mets were making things interesting. When they were rallying in the ninth inning and Joey Wendell gets a base hit, Starling Marte gets a base hit, I'm sitting there with the Mets down by four runs. We all are if you're watching. And Pete Alonzo's on deck. Now, Francisco Lindor to this point had not had like this awful homestand. Met fans gave him a nice big hand to start. He got on base twice. Nothing amazing on Friday, but a little bit of improvement. A walk, a base hit. Okay, a little bit of a positive. And he drew a walk. Lindor was breaking out of it, but okay, you're starting to see some small positives. After Marte's base hit, with Pete Alonso having this magical, magical day, and Pete being the tying run if Lindor can get on base, I'm sitting there thinking, Francisco, this is the one moment all year where I'm begging you, find the freaking way to get on base because we deserve, and Pete deserves, that chance. Now, the odds of Alonzo hitting a game-tying grand slam, his third home run of the game, very low. I mean, I'll be honest with you. The, the odds were very, very slim. But as Lindor is at the plate, facing the immortal James MacArthur, I'm just begging. I am like Francisco. Kid, I don't give a crap if you hit by a pitch. I don't care if you draw a walk. I don't care if you lay down a bunt. I don't care if it's a bloop to right field. For the love of God, can you get on base? And when he hit that ground ball to second base, it was more so than any moment this year. And obviously, Francisco's gotten off to a terrible start. We all know that. It was the most pissed off I was at him. I was angry at him. Now, I wasn't in the ballpark to boo. I was actually dressed in a suit and tie, ready to go out and spend the evening with my lovely wife celebrating her birthday at a very, very fancy overpriced restaurant. Now, it wasn't overpriced. It was, it was very expensive, but it was worth it. Like, sometimes you spend a lot of money, and you're like, you know what? I got my money's worth. I, I would say that was the case. I'm not going to name the place, but I was annoyed at Lindor. Like, Francisco, can you freaking get on base? Can you give Pete and us, the 12 people that showed up at City Field on a Saturday windy afternoon, can you give us that possibility of an Alonzo Grand Slam? And that's what annoyed me on Saturday. That was actually my big, besides Manaya sucking, that was my biggest takeaway from Saturday that Lindor couldn't get on base in front of Pete. Yeah, I mean, listen, it, 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 he is struggling. I mean, he struggled on Sunday again as, as well, and he keeps on getting those opportunities right now. I... I'm still not at that point. I'm frustrated. I, I don't know how it's possible, but I'm still giving him a pass. Well, I, I'm giving him a, not a pass. I'm, I'm frustrated in terms of moments like that, but overall, I'm not worried. I guess that that'd be the way I'd phrase it. I'm not worried yet. It's still, you know, the middle of April. He's clearly off to a terrible start. Guys get off to terrible starts 
And I said this last time on the Rico, and I'll say it again now. I love when you can overcome your best players not playing well and win anyway. I think that's a great sign because I think he is going to play well. So for the Mets to win yet another series with Lindor, look, he wasn't awful in this series. I think overall he was three for 11 for with two walks. So it's not like he was 0 for 18, but it wasn't like he's breaking out. I'm not worried. I, I just felt that that moment was frustrating. But it was another good sign, if you believe in this kind of crap, that the Mets are never out of a game. That they don't lay over and play dead, despite on an afternoon like this where your starting pitcher gives you this non-competitive outing. Because three and a third innings, eight runs, six earned. I'm sorry, that's a non that's a non-competitive outing. You know, there are going to be bad performances. But to me, can you make a bad performance, five innings, five runs, something of that nature? Three and two-thirds innings, which means you're only getting 11 outs, which means you're asking your bullpen to do an awful lot. And you give up eight runs? It was just a lousy performance by Sean Manaya. How about this Tyler J, though? Two more scoreless innings. It, it's sort of underrated because the Mets didn't come back. But Tyler J did another good job. And you know what his reward for that was? Bye-bye. You're going to triple A. Yeah, I think we'll see him again, though. Yeah, so after the game on Saturday, Tyler J was sent out. Cole Sulser was sent out. No one's crying about that. And it came Jose Budo to make the start on Sunday, and up came Grant Hartwig to enter the bullpen. By the way, the, the Hartwig J thing to me, I don't need. Like I said, Tyler J deserved to sort of remain up here. Uh, obviously, they needed to make room for Jose Budo, who is now going to rejoin the rotation, clearly, based on the way he's pitching. But I, I didn't need to see Tyler J go away. Two solid performances by him. As far as Sunday's concern, can we start with the, the greatness of Jose Budo? My man, Big Budo. I love Big Budos, and I cannot lie. And by the way, I get no credit for that. Because you know who wrote, I love Big Budo, and I cannot lie, Pete? You know who, you know who said that first? Not me. Uh, so it, you said wrote, so I'm assuming that means it's either a tweet or an email. I'm going to say it's a tweet, and it's from no. Morash? It is not a tweet from Morash. It's not a tweet from anybody, at least not that I saw him. Maybe someone else did it. And it's not an email. It's the City Field scoreboard. <laughs> Come that's on, good. man. That's a good that's job. Good. That's good. That's good. That's the City Field scoreboard. When they, threw like... that up, when they threw that up there, were the dancers on there as well or no? The best you know, dancers? I want to say this about the dancers, because before the game on Sunday, I went to Sunday's game, obviously Doc Gooden retirement ceremony, and we'll get to Doc coming up in a few minutes. I ran into Frank the Tank, and I do want to say this about Frank the Tank. I know that there are some listeners to the Rico who do not like him. I know there are some listeners to the Rico that love him. Frank the Tank, and I say this to anybody who asks me, is who he is. The idea that he's fake, the idea that he's a fraud, the idea that he's you know, acting that way to get attention. I'm telling you, it's not true. Like he literally is, you want to say he's too negative of a fan. Yes, he's a negative fan, but that's who he is. So I like Frank because I think he is genuine. So I ran into Frank the Tank and he says to me, he said, we, we talked about a few things, but one of the things that was bothering him were those dancers. He's like, I know these dancers. <laughs> and I said to Frank, what I'll tell you guys now, the game I went to on Sunday was my fourth game of the season. So they have now played nine home games. I've been to four of them. So I'm at about a 50% pace, a little bit underneath that. I have not noticed that. Like, it's not even something, whether it's my fault for not paying attention, that I'm too focused on the game or scoring it or whatever. I have not noticed their existence, other than briefly on opening day. So it's not something I hate because I don't notice it. I'm being dead honest about this. Do they not? I picked up do they on. not? Do they not announce it? Like, let me put it this way: I went to three. I went to that entire Toronto Blue Jays series uh, at Yankee Stadium because my son's a big Yankee fan. They all wanted to go. Whatever the case is, I noticed every single like thing they did every single day. Like every inning, they did the same thing. It was on repeat. Like, did they not put it on notice on blast that like, hey, by the way? Met City dancers coming up. Like they didn't even they don't I acknowledge th it. I think they did. I just don't think I notice it. Like I'm not listening to everything that's put on the scoreboard. Now I know that there's a lot of in-game entertainment. So they'll play the hat game. You know, they'll put the thing under the hat and everybody will guess. 
They'll have everybody vote on what song is going to be the sing-along song in the eighth inning. They have a segment where a kid usually runs from third base to left field to replace the third base bag. Like, there's a lot of things I do notice, so I'm not completely oblivious. I think they mention it. I just don't think it garners my attention for whatever reason. It just doesn't – it's not – and by the way, I think that's a compliment. I think that means that it's not, you know, blaring in my ear and so over the top that it's annoying me. It doesn't mean anything to me. Like, my experience at City Field feels very similar – to the way it's been over the last couple of years, other than the fact that they took a, a gate away from us, <laughs> those who sit in my section. <laughs> and by the way, I've had a lot of season ticket holders come up to me uh, when I see them at games saying, can you believe they took the Hodges away? I'm like, yeah, no, I know it sucks. Trust me, I I agree. It sucks. What can you do? They're charging you more money and they're giving you less features, which is always a very, very tough sell. But as far as Sunday's game was concerned, Obviously, we had the Doc retirement ceremony, which I'll get to after we talk about the game and everything else from this weekend. But what jumped out at me and really has to excite you, if you're a Met fan, this has to excite you, is Jose Budo. And the reason why we now have to start to get a little like, oh, 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 maybe we got something here, is for those of you who watched the latter part of last year, who hung in there as things were getting ugly, Jose Budo was in the rotation down the stretch of last season. And as you may recall, it was only a handful of starts, but in the month of September, Jose Budo looked good. Jose Budo looked very, very good. He made five starts in the month of September, and four of the five were very good to excellent. So if you didn't pay attention in September... And look, we talked about it on the Rico. What do we read from this? Does this mean he should be in the rotation? What does this mean for the young man? So we talked about it, but we also didn't know because it was September. Six and a third, two runs against the Nats. Five innings, one run against the NL champion Diamondbacks. Six innings, one run against Miami. The mediocre start was against Philly. Four innings, four runs. And then he comes back against the Phillies. Six innings, two runs. Jose Budo is 26 years old. He gave you a good September. And now he's given you two starts to the season. One in the doubleheader. And then this one on Sunday against Kansas City, in which he's looked very, very good. And the one on Sunday, the one we're talking about right now, was his best. Because outside of the leadoff double he gave up to Salvador Perez in the second inning, he dominated. Like, this wasn't just a guy who was getting lucky. He got a ton of swing and misses. He had nine strikeouts, including the side to start the game. He fought through the trouble in the second inning by getting a huge couple of strikeouts. And for the most part, was just in complete command. And the reason why this has to excite you is there are three things. Well, maybe four things if you want to stretch it out. Number one, the fact that this was the beginning that we saw in September. Four good starts, which means it's now six of seven starts that Budo has made since entering the Met rotation back in September, have been very good. That's number one. Number two, 26 years old. Like, we're not talking about a 32-year-old they picked up off the scrap heap. He's 26 years old. And here's number three. DeGrom becoming a superstar when he was never even a top, top prospect always puts the back of your mind that maybe you're going to find that next great, or just in this case, very good, hopefully, starting pitcher from anywhere. So what Jose Budo proved with this performance against Kansas City, and Carlos Mendoza made that very clear after the game, and this should be obvious to us all, is that he's in the rotation. And now Jose Budo's got himself a fair shot. And if he struggles in his next start, which, by the way, is going to be against the Dodgers, good luck, Jose. Like, you want to step up in competition, here we go. I think he's earned now. He can have a bad start against the Dodgers. You know what I mean? Like, not not that we're not going to care. We'll care, but he can have that. I think he's earned that opportunity now to make the next four or five starts. And we'll take it from there. Obviously, if he he struggles, you know, we'll, we'll have a discussion. But I think that his performance now was good enough in these two spot starts, the one in the doubleheader, and then the one on Sunday against the Royals, in conjunction with the four starts he made at the end of the year to say, you know what? This kid deserves a shot. So I'm cautiously excited. That's how I'll phrase it. I'm cautiously excited 
about Jose Budo because I love Big Budo and I cannot lie. Uh, not to be a Debbie Downer about the Budo, but how many options does he? Do you still have a lot of options left or no? Yeah, he's got a few options. He may end up back in the minor leagues. Yeah. That and that sucks, dude. No, no, that no. Is, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's different though, because with bullpen arms, you're right. They who's who's replacing him in the rotation? It's his spot, bro. Well, you just never know. You never know what's. I mean, for for now, but if they want to try Lucchese, if they want to try anybody, like I mean, listen, you got some time with Kodai Senga, so that's okay. You, but you just never know. I, I feel like this is something. Now I don't know Stearns yet on this level. But this is something where I wouldn't be surprised if somehow Budo wasn't around as long as we want him to be. No, no. He's around. See, what I think he did on Sunday is he's around as long as he pitches well. Unfortunately, I think before that, it wasn't necessarily a slam dunk. I mean, he was behind guys on the totem pole. But with Tyler McGill on the injured list, and now with Budo giving you another really good performance, he is in the rotation until... Not until Kodai Senga comes back, because God knows when that's going to be. That's not anytime soon, by the way. That's well over a month, I think. He's in the rotation until he's earned not being in the rotation. That's where we are with Jose Budo. He is now a member of the rotation until we're all sitting here on the Rico saying, oh my God, Jose Budo stinks. Get him out of the rotation. That, that's where we're at. And, and look, that we're all different with that. I think based on these two performances and what he did last September, I've got to make in three or four more starts, 100%. You know, obviously, I say three or four because if all of a sudden he's throwing batting practice in his next three or four starts, it's a different discussion. But sometimes in baseball, like, DeGrom did it. And I'm not comparing him to Jacob DeGrom by any stretch. Jake turned out to be one of the great pitchers in our franchise's history. But if you remember when DeGrom was called up in 2014, he was not supposed to remain in the rotation. In fact, Rafael Montero was supposed to be in the rotation and DeGrom was supposed to come up, make a start, go back down to the minor leagues. And DeGrom was so good in his start against the Yankees that he stayed and he never went away. I think what Budo has done, it's taken him a while, is he is now in that position if he pitches well enough to not give the rotation spot back. And that was very encouraging to see. With that said, Sunday was a very frustrating game because – you go back to the first inning of this game, Brandon Nimmo gets a leadoff single against the lefty Cole Reagans, and they do nothing. They get two on in the fourth inning on back-to-back -back hits by Marte and Lindor, and they get nothing. And not only back-to-back -back hits, you had the miscue in right field by Renfro that set up second and third and nobody out, and they can't score. Pete Alonzo, it's that foul pop-up, and then Tyrone Taylor, it's a line drive right at M MJ Melendez, and I had no problem with Marte trying to score. And you got kind of that mini collision at the plate. Salvador Perez is banged up. I wish him the best. I hate you, Salvador Perez, but I respect you. I mean, come on, World Series MVP. He's crapping all over us this weekend. Uh, but I, I just certainly don't want to see him get hurt. But second and third, nobody out. They can't score. Then they get two on in the fifth inning, two out. Brandon Nimmo, big spot. They can't score. Then they get two on in the sixth inning, one out. Tyrone Taylor, Francisco Alvarez, they can't score, including Francisco going after a 3-0 pitch and hitting a ground ball that off the bat I thought was going to sneak through for a base hit. Then in the seventh inning, they load the bases up, and this is where I heard some boos for Francisco Lindor. Lindor came up, bases loaded, two outs in the seventh after Marte drew the walk, and on the very first pitch, and I think that's probably what is frustrating, he hits a high pop-up. It was not a loud chorus of boos. It was more a uh, chorus of boos. And this, of course, comes on the heels of Lindor getting some really huge hands from the Met crowd. And here's what I want to know about the, the Lindor hands, because I have no issue with Francisco Lindor getting a lot of love. I think Pete was mad at me because on the air, and I said it on the Rico, but I certainly said it on the fan, I thought the Lindor, hey, let's cheer for him thing was based on like non-reality because I never felt Lindor was being booed by Met fans, so why do we have to go out of our way to cheer for him? It's not like he's been getting abused by Met fans. Now, I had a lady at the book signing who said, Evan, you got it all wrong. And I said, tell me, I'm, I'm more than welcome. I, maybe I am wrong. And she said the cheering for Lindor, which the Met fans did over the weekend, was not about encouragement. It was not about Trey Turner. 
It was about sending a message to him that those idiots who post horrible things on social media and taunted his wife and kids that they don't represent us. And I said to her, if that's the case, I'm all for it. Like if the cheering like overwhelmingly for Lindor, by the way, I cheer for all my guys anyway. So it's kind of a, a weird subject. Like when I go to a game, I don't give a crap who it is. Like I'm let's go, you know, I'm, I'm cheering for you. And I, I'm not a boor. So I'm talking more, I guess, in generalities or about everybody else. But I said, that's great. If that's what this is about, of course, I fully support it. But I don't think that's what it was about. That's not what Gary Cohen was saying on TV. That's not what, again, maybe this is, people were doing things for two different reasons. And so some were saying, hey, let's support him because it's going to get him going like Trey Turner, which I think is dopey. And maybe some were saying, hey, let's just remind him that we're not all a bunch of vile creatures. Obviously, that motivation is great. The, the showing him that we're all not vile creatures. I just thought the whole idea that he needs to be cheered, you know, because we're going to be Philadelphia. I thought it was stupid. And I didn't think it was based on like we were treating him badly. So you tell me, Pete, what was the point of cheering Lindor? Was it to send a message that we're not vile creatures or was it, hey, let's be supportive? Yay. Maybe my timeline is messed up, but I honestly thought that the tweets to Lindor's wife came after the idea to cheer Lindor. So I, my intent was this is to support Lindor to say, we love you, Lindor, no matter how shitty you are. <laughs> and by the way, what's the statute of limitations on that? Because people booed him when he popped up in the eighth <laughs> inning. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's starting to come to an end. I think by uh, April 20th, you get to kiss that goodbye. I will say uh, I've witnessed many Met players get booed here, many. And sometimes I would have these discussions with my dad and friends, and I'd say it's weird who the crowd turns on and how quickly they turn on them. And usually it's guys making a lot of money. I have not gotten the sense in the years Francisco's been here that the crowd is eager to boo him. And, and I've gotten that sense with a lot of former Mets where they were eager to boo Roger Cedeno. They were eager to boo Jeremy Burnitz. They were eager to boo Bobby Bonilla. They were eager to boo, I don't want to say Jason Bay. I don't think the crowd was ever eager to boo Jason Bay. Eager to boo Oliver Perez. Like one bet, we're ready to boo you. I don't get the sense they were ever eager. By the way, I think they were eager to boo Carlos Beltran at times. I don't get that sense about Lindor. I think Lindor and Met fans actually have a pretty damn good relationship, which I guess is why I found the whole thing sort of weird. Like, I didn't think there was a problem to begin with. Well, well, let me let me explain something real quickly, because okay? there's a couple things. I, I don't want to boo Lindor. I'm a supporter of Lindor. He hasn't had the easiest go. Clearly, him and McNeil didn't have a, a, a good start to, to his career here with the Mets. They went all, They were off the edge a little bit. Uh, when his boy Javi Baez came here, the thumbs down, that was a good presence. He learned from that. But the other thing is, and this is maybe just me just trying to be, I can't complain about Lindor every day for the next 13 years. He's here for 13 years, right? Like, he's going to be here for a long time. This is year four of Francisco Lindor. Like, he's still not going anywhere. So if, it, like, at some point in time, like, yeah, maybe like in like four or five years, if he's still just terrible and never shows up and he's the worst player in baseball, yeah, maybe then I'll get on him. But like at the end of the day, his numbers are consistently good. Last year was a 30, 30, 30 year. I mean, what else do you, he's, he's a top 10 in the MVP the past two years. What else do I want out of the guy? He's well, not bad. All, all I want right now is him to wake up. I don't, I'm not, well, I'm not yeah. talking about his career here. I think sometimes we get lost in that. When we are frustrated with a player, we start rewriting what they've done as a Met. This has nothing to do with what he did last year or what he did the year before. It has to do with what he's doing right now. And they need to get him going. And they certainly need to get him going from the left side of the plate because it seems like his best at-bats have all come from the right side. And now we have a sample size of really a year plus because – Francisco Lindor hasn't always been a far, far better hitter right-handed than left-handed. That is a newer phenomenon. That's something that we did see last year. I cannot deny that. And certainly in the small sample size of this year, we've seen the same thing. But run him out there every day and get him going. I'm not worried yet. I was just frustrated. And I think a lot of us are. That there are at-bats, especially 
not as much the bases loaded spot in the seventh inning, which I was probably naive to not be as frustrated as I was from the night before, the day before. I was more frustrated the day before because it ended the game, and I wanted that one crack to see Pete Alonso with the bases loaded. But either way, I love the fact the Mets are winning, and he hasn't gotten going yet. I love the fact that Lindor is stuck on one home run, two RBIs, and a batting average, you know, on the interstate, and they're still going out and winning every series. A couple of Mendoza observations. Carlos Mendoza. I told you, give me a couple weeks. I'll start to formulate an opinion of him. Well, I've got one I'm a little frustrated with. Not a big deal in this game. Didn't impact this game, but I'm getting ahead of it because there will be games in which it impacts. Twice on Sunday, the Mets had a spot with a runner on first, less than two outs, a 3-2 count, and I'm looking over saying, let's send them. Let's be aggressive. And both times, we didn't see it. I found that a little bit frustrating. Little bit frustrating. One of the cases was in the sixth inning. I, I'll give you the situation so everybody can kind of be on the same page and say, Evan, you're wrong. Evan, you're right. 0-0 zero, zero on Sunday. Sixth inning, Lindor led off with a base hit. Did have a two-hit game on Sunday. Let's keep that in mind despite the foul pop-up. Pete Alonso's up three and two count. Yes, Alonso's a strikeout candidate, but he's also a double play candidate. And my base runner is Francisco Lindor. And I've done nothing offensively. Push the envelope. And not only that, Salvador Perez came out of the game one inning earlier because of that collision at the plate. So I got a guy in there in Freddie Fermin who just came in the game. Why not push the envelope? Why not? The other situation, I'm trying to remember specifically what it was. There was another 3-2. Oh, I got it. I'll give it to you. And it could have backfired because the guy struck out, but I always want to be fair about this. Jeff McNeil on first, one out, Zach Short, three and two count. Fourth inning. Third inning. Let's go. Let's just be aggressive. Did not do it. We do not see a lot of aggressiveness from this manager. And that's something that comes from the dugout. Obviously, there's some guys that are going to run on their own, but I like the idea three and two, push the envelope. And maybe it's because I'm so used to the Mets not being able to throw anybody out at second base, but why not push it? Now, let's get to Zach Short. Zach, if you're listening to this podcast, I got nothing against you, all right? You are an innocent pawn in this game. Why the hell is Zach Short on this roster? You know, sometimes I bitch about stuff. And maybe a few days later, maybe a week later, I will come to my senses and say, boy, I got that one wrong. Boy, the Mets got that one right. Or I got that wrong. They got this right. When they announced the roster and Mark Vientos was optioned out of the minor leagues and Zach Short made the team, I came here into this microphone on the Rico and said, what are we doing? Like, why isn't Vientos getting that opportunity to play right now? Vientos goes to AAA. For the most part, he's hit. Zach Short is useless on this team. He barely plays. And then when he does play like on Sunday, you say, what a waste of time. Like, do I really need to sit Brett Beatty against a lefty when he's hit lefties for Zach Short? If it's Vientos, fine. You're going to sit Brett Beatty for Zach Short. Why is that? To justify why this guy's on the roster? Because he shouldn't be on the roster. His defense is okay, all right? I'm not saying he's terrible despite that big error early in the season behind Luis Severino, but you see it. He's barely used. And you got a guy in Vientos where you could have given him this opportunity over the last three weeks. Now, I don't know what he would have done. It's very possible Vientos would have hit nothing and he would have proved to us yet again, hey, that's not a major leaguer. And if that's the case, fine. But instead, you've kept him in the minor leagues where if he's not getting the shot now, when's he ever getting the shot? They don't have a DH right now. J.D. Martinez isn't here. And don't give me this. They need versatility. Joey Wendell's barely used. And Joey Wendell can fill that role. It is mind-boggling. And I get this is not a headline thing. This is not a sexy thing to talk about. Probably not even going to spend much time on the fan talking about it, but I'll do it here on the Rico because it makes no sense. 
Someone's got to explain to me. And don't give me the same crap you gave me two weeks ago. They, they like the versatility on their roster. They're not even using it. Why is Zach Short here and Mark Vientos is in the minor leagues? Why? First of all, I, we don't even know when J.D.'s coming back. The last update on J.D. Martinez from Mendoza on Sunday was, oh, he's feeling better. He'll start to swing a bat. He'll start to swing a bat. Like, he, he's probably weeks away. And I'm not even ranting about J.D. Martinez. Like, it sucks that he wasn't ready. It stinks he's still not ready. But this was an opportunity to see what you had Mark Vientos. You want to see what you have with a lot of these kids? I mean, do we really need DJ Stewart against every right-hander? Do we really need Brett Beatty sitting against a lefty for Zach Short? I like that Tyrone Taylor's played, so I don't want to bitch about, oh, do we need Tyrone Taylor? I have liked Tyrone Taylor. He's played well. But trust me, you can still get Tyrone Taylor at bats if Mark Vientos is up here. So that, that just, I don't get it. That's the and, thing. Just and, and let's be serious now. They the the third base job is Brett Beatty's, so that's not he's not gonna he's not gonna find a way to wiggle his way into third base. He's no, no, it, it, his opportunity is at DH right now without there being a true DH, and they've kind of just thrown that opportunity away. Now, as far as the Mets finally winning this game, give Harrison Bader a lot of credit. He put bat on ball. It was going to be a very close play at first base with the bases loaded. They had two quality at-bats in a row by Jeff McNeil and Brett Beatty to work the bases loaded. Yet Tyrone Taylor laying down a bunt, which I did like. I like that. Runner on first, nobody out. Tie game, eighth inning. And then obviously had Bader getting the infield hit. Brandon Immo drawing the walk to get the 2 nothing lead. And then Edwin Diaz. I give you credit, Edwin. I wanted you to get that run out of the way now. And he gave it up. A bomb to Vinny Pasquantino. But he did it with a 2 nothing lead, a solo shot with two outs. When Pasquantino hit the home run, I was actually happy. I was happy, believe it or not, because he gave up a home run. He Look, he's going to give up runs this season. Like Edwin Diaz was never going to pitch to a zero ERA. He got the kind of, hey, I haven't pitched in five, six days out of the way. And it didn't matter because what does he do? He gets the next hitter, Freddie, for me to pop up. Mets win. And I was never nervous. I don't think any of us was. And that's the beauty of Edwin Diaz that for the most part, when he comes into games, there's no nerves. So very good win on Sunday, a very good series win, third consecutive series victory, one game under 500. I think we all collectively feel good about where we are. I, I think it's amazing right now where we are, seven and eight on the schedule after going 0-5, three straight series. But I do have to give a special shout out. And I understand, I think I know why Harrison Bader had a big hit today. Because before he even got to the field, do you know where he was this morning? Uh, he was at an MMA event with Pete Hoffman. No, close. No. <laughs> Very close. Oh, he ahead. was visiting the 8U League in East Chester. Nice. I wasn't there for it, but I heard he showed up at Chester Heights in, in, in uh, East Chester. He was just checking the scene out, saying what's up to the kids. Really awesome for him to do that. I think that was a good way to start the day off. He started the vibes well. He got the juju going. Good, there you go. Good job by him. Good job by the master himself, Harrison Bader, coming through with a big infield single, and the Mets making it hold up by beating the Royals 2-1. to one. So typical of baseball. Lose 11-7, come back and win 2-1. Now let's get the doc. Let's get to the doc day. Uh, I'll start with the attendance. There, and, and I talked about this on air with Tiki and the show about five days ago. Six, uh, actually, more than that, because I think it was during that series against Detroit where I revealed a piece of information that I thought was fascinating. I did some research after they played. I think it was the first game of the Tiger series, or maybe it was the yeah the first game of the Tiger series, in which. I said, do you realize that the crowd for that game was the smallest non-pandemic crowd in the history of City Field? And I found that to be so surprising because the Mets have had a lot of bad years at City Field. The Mets have had a lot of bad off seasons going into City Field. So for anyone who says the weather or this or that, I mean, come on, City Field's been around for 15 years. You're telling me there's never been a game that was worthy of having a smaller crowd than the Monday night crowd against Detroit? That trend has continued. The crowd on Friday night, a Friday night, and the weather wasn't you know, sparkling by any stretch, but again, it's a Friday night. It's baseball. 
The Mets are taking on the Kansas City Royals. And they announced, again, announced a crowd of 18,000 people. Only the third time in the history of City Field that they announced a crowd of under 20,000. Then they go out and they play a game on Saturday, which is supposed to be your prime time. Plus, they had a great giveaway, a Doc Gooden bobblehead, and they announced 25,000. Again, a microscopic crowd at City Field. And then you've got Doc Gooden Day. And I knew what I think we all knew. And I love Doc. They were never coming close to selling this game out. They ended up announcing 32,000, which, I mean, it's a lot better than these other crowds. It filled in a lot better because when the Doc ceremony started, I even tweeted out a picture of it. The place was very, very empty. It filled in better as the day went on. But the crowds are horrible. I mean, just no look, we could sugarcoat it all we want. I'm not. The crowds are terrible. And so it leads to the logical question, well, why? Like, why have the city field crowds been so bad? Why with Doc Gooden Day, with a beautiful, beautiful day? I know there was a little bit of a rain shower, but for the most part, an absolutely gorgeous Sunday afternoon. How are the Yankees getting bigger crowds on weeknights against the Marlins than the Mets getting on a Sunday afternoon in which they're retiring Doc's number? And let that marinate for a second. If you want to play the game of, oh, it's it's the weather's fault. It's this is fault. Like the Yankees are getting better crowds on weeknights against the Marlins than the Mets are getting for Doc Gooden Day. And I'm not saying this because I'm angry at Mets fans. I always try to figure out, well, why? What's the reason for it? And, and here's my only conclusion to this. Because I think that you're going to hear a lot of discussions about the offseason and Mets fans are just not, they don't trust this team. And I think a lot of that's true. I think the overwhelming reason is they raise ticket prices. You, you cannot have a product that the fans believe has gotten worse and you're charging them more. You can't do that. I also know that they screwed with a lot of the partial plans. I think that turned people off. Like the Mets invested in City Field and they put some new features in City Field, but they also made it more expensive to go. And that's a very tough sell when you're coming off a bad year. You know, I only bring this up because I think it's a it's an interesting juxtaposition. Do you realize that the Brooklyn Nets sold out every game this year except for like two? I'm sure most people are like, well, that makes no sense. Who cares about the Nets? It's just another way for Evan to stick in the Nets in a, in a podcast. Maybe, but I want you to tell me why. <laughs> why they sell out almost every game but two? They suck uh, and no one cares. Do Maybe it's the area. It's a little bit livelier. But by the way, I can't say you're wrong about, hey, it's a great area and it's tough to do. I would tell you as a season ticket holder to them and a season ticket holder to the Mets that going to a Brooklyn Net game is cheap, very, very cheap. And so I think it allows people to say, hey, I want to go to a basketball game, even if I don't care about the team, but I'm going to go because it's, it's an affordable night. Like my season tickets were ridiculously affordable. And I saw what it was on the secondary market. Like they were cheap. And subsequently, the building was filled every single night, even for a franchise that it has no idea what they're doing, by the way, uh, clueless and sucks, but they were packed every night. And my thought throughout this whole season, when I was, I had the exact opposite view of the Mets where I'm like, why is Barkley center packed? Like, why was I able to sell my tickets tonight? I say it with a smile. And the only conclusion I could come up with is that they made it affordable to go. And the Mets have done the opposite. So you're going to hear a lot of theories, probably on our own station, about why the Mets didn't draw Doc Day, why they haven't drawn well this season. And a lot of the things you're going to hear, yeah, there's truth to everything. Like, the fans don't believe in this team. There is absolutely a truth to that. No question. This was not a great offseason for fans. There's a ton of truth to that. But ultimately, what leads the pack on this, and I know this because I'm a season ticket holder and I feel it, is they raised prices. And I see how angry some of my fellow season ticket holders are. But the group of season ticket holders that come up to me and myself, see, we're in a group that's called schmucks, which means we're going to give them our money anyway. So it's not like we're not showing up. So you can't say it. it's not like me being angry is the reason why the Mets aren't drawing well. I think they made a miscalculation or maybe not. Look, Steve's a businessman. He may come to the conclusion 18,000 people spending more money is better than 28,000 people, and I'm charging them less. I have no idea. Maybe that's the business decision they've made. 
But that ultimately, you know, 15 games into the season is why I think the crowds are down. And I think with Doc, what sucks is that I'm a 40-year-old guy. I only remember the end of Doc's career as a Met. So maybe that's a part of it where you have a lot of your fan base, maybe some people listening to the Rico right now in their 30s or in their 20s who are like, yeah, Doc's just a historical figure. I wasn't motivated to go to the box office and spend money to watch this ceremony. Look, it stinks, man. In an ideal world, I love my sports teams. I always want the building to be packed. I'm always rooting for the building to be packed. It's not as if I have a motivation for it not to be packed. I love that energy in that stadium when it's filled. But that that's the conclusion I've come to. Just seeing the other side of it as a season ticket holder, talking to fellow season ticket holders, talking to planned package guys who were ticked off about what they did. I think that's the main reason why we're seeing these terrible crowds. Because, look, 32,000 people for Doc Good Retirement Ceremony, Pete, that's not a good crowd. Let's not beat around the bush. It's not. No, no, it's not. And I think that that's this is this is why we keep on hearing about Steve Cole and what he wants to do around the the area to build it up. Because let me put it this way, and this is why I really truly think that you're right. Ticket prices have gone up, and that's probably definitely why parking has gone up too. Like, dude, not for long, not for not for nothing, but for a, the longest time, I used to have a parking spot across from the stadium. For free, I knew where it was. We never had to pay for it. It was great. Now it's forty bucks. It, everything has just gone up in price. So you're you're right about that. But on the other hand, Cohen, I think views and values this area and says I need to make it a necessity to come to City Field. It needs to match because the one thing that the that, that Yankee Stadium has that we do not have, it has that nostalgia. It has that history. It it has. Just it's been around forever, and they've had that level of success. It's a, it's like the New York Knicks. You go to MSG, you want to go, you have to go. Whether it's a corporate ticket or whatever, you have to go see the Yankees. You haven't had to go see the Mets, but Cohen's going to try to change that. Yeah, I, I think things around the stadium are great, but it's not the reason why they're not drawing because there's never been anything around City Field and Chase Stadium, and there's been other years where they've drawn better. The Mets have set a pace in a non-pandemic year to have their worst attended year in city field history. Now that can change because the other thing I've noticed all these years going to games is that sometimes a team's got to prove they're worth spending money on. And if the Mets build off of what they've done and they continue to play well, and it's going to take time, it doesn't happen overnight, but if the Mets prove they're legitimate and they're in a divisional race there, I say with Atlanta, the people will come. Like, there's a chance for that to change. But notice this throughout Met history. The Mets' best attendance years are not when they win. It's the year after they win. 2016 had better attendance than 2015. 1987 had better attendance than 1986. So sometimes it's proving yourself, and then people will show up. And and also, um, no, I just blanked on my total thought. I was so close to something that I I, I had something beautifully set up and I blanked on it and I'll get back to it later. We'll save it because this is an extended Rico. We still have a lot more to do, even if we've already done an hour so far here on the Rico. Oh, I remember it. I remember yes, it. Go ahead. Could part of it also be that they could have maybe pushed this date back to sometime in like May or June? Did it have to be April yeah, 14th? It, it would have been better if it was in May or June. I guess it still doesn't. It would have been better. But 32,000 people is still a bad crowd <laughs> for it. So, yeah. And, and we'll see that with Daryl Day. I mean, Daryl has a day in June. So if it's 75 degrees and maybe the team is playing well, maybe they'll get a bigger crowd when they retire Daryl Strawberry's number. As far as Doc's speech is concerned, he said something to Tiki and I when he joined us on Friday, and he mentioned the same thing and went into further detail on it. And that was, you know, I brought up to Doc when he came on our show on Friday the return as a Yankee to Shea Stadium. That's a game that's in my book, my Mets Bible. It's a game that kind of scarred me as a Mets fan, watching Doc Gooden return to Shea Stadium for the first time as a Yankee. And I asked him about, hey, did you ever come close to coming back at any point? And Doc revealed, and he made sure, forget the interview with us, because that's just him answering a question. But during a Hall of Fame speech, he went out of his way to say, I called the Mets. I wanted to come back after 97. They said, we don't have room. I called them after 99 to try to come back. They said, 
we have no room. I called them in 2000 after I got released by Tampa Bay, and they said they had no room. I called them after I retired to sign a one-day contract, and they said no. And that, to me, was all about saying the Wilpons never wanted me back. That's what that was about. And without saying F the Wilpons, which Doc is too classy to do, that's clearly what hurt him. And it hurt him. That's why he brings that up in a speech. That's why he says it to Tiki and I on Friday. He's not saying it because, ha-ha, screw the Wilpons. He's saying it because it hurt him. And hearing it hurts me as a Met fan, thinking about, wow, Doc Gooden returning to the Mets in 1998, even if he wasn't great. Doc Gooden returning to the Mets in 2000, not as a Yankee at Shea Stadium, but as a Met. And every time Doc brought up, you know, where he went, like going to the Yankees in 94, the crowd, or 95, the crowd started booing. (laughs) And Doc said, hey, 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 I'm a Met. Let me make that clear. I am a Met. And then the crowd cheered. And then he mentioned the Yankees again in 2000 because the Yankees brought him in, crowd booed again. And Doc's like, man, I told you, I'm a Met. So I thought that part was very, very cool because it came from the heart and it clearly bothers him. And it bothers me as a Met fan thinking that, and this isn't on Steve Phillips, because I know he said, oh, nothing against Steve Phillips. Steve Phillips said we didn't have room. That's not about the Mets not having room. If you bring a guy in on a non-roster guarantee or, hey, I'll go to the minor leagues, which Doc offered to do and Doc did with the Yankees, that's not about not having room. That about That's about the Will Ponds and maybe Nelson Doubleday, who was still there at the time, saying, we don't want you. And I thought what was so beautiful about Sunday, and obviously it happened long before that with – the Mets Hall of Fame, and with him just being present at City Field, he's back, and we want him. And I thought that was very, very cool, and it was awesome to see. And I got a little mystified. I ain't going to lie, because I do remember Doc. You know, I was very young, but I do remember Doc, even if it wasn't the great of Doc. It's not 85. I certainly don't remember 85 and well about it, but, you know, I was a year and a half years old as he was doing that. But I got a little misty-eyed as I saw the 16 at the rafters. So. Look, I was always very picky about what number should be retired. I thought it should be exclusive to Hall of Famers, but the Mets made a decision to change that and open it up more to Jerry Kuzman and Keith Hernandez. And if you're going to retire Jerry Kuzman's number and you're going to retire Keith Hernandez's number, I think it's cool that Doc now has that and Daryl now has that. And I'll make you this prediction. Doc Gooden, maybe because it was so long ago, 40 years ago when he made his major league debut, didn't sell out City Field. It didn't become this hot must-have ticket. We'll see about Daryl Strawberry. There is one guy who, when the Mets announce they're going to retire his number, the place will be, they could they could play the game in the middle of March. They could play the game in December. But when they decide to retire number five for David Wright, that building will be packed. That building will be electric because David Wright represents an era to a lot of Mets fans and a generation of Mets fans. So whenever they decide to do that, and I'm not sure when they want to do that with David. I don't know if there's a right time. It's not going to be 40 years like it was for Doc or the amount of years they waited on Jerry Kuzman and Keith Hernandez. But when they decide to retire David Wright's number, I think based on age, generation, and impact, that building will be packed. But it's very, very cool to see Doc's number retired. That was very enjoyable. Now, let's get a couple of emails in there. Because I can't ignore emails. I know we've been potting for a long time. I apologize. But it's important to hear from the people. So let's start off with Addison Butler. Addison writes, I hope you treated your wife to a beautiful birthday because she deserves it. That is true. I did. Two kids and she married to you. What a saint. (laughs) Thank you for that. Uh, By the way, just to interrupt before you go any further, we are on YouTube Live, which you can subscribe below. You have your flashlight on. So when you (laughs) print that, I do have my people, flashlight on. Would you like me to shut that your, off? Yes, people can't see your lovely face. That's probably a good thing. Uh, sorry about that. Addison writes, I'm watching the Saturday game against the Royals and something I was thinking about before this game continued with Brandon Nimmo. So we are, of course, seeing a not-so-good start to the season at the plate. The amazing game he had where he went 4-4 four four with five RBIs against the Braves, he was back in center instead of left. Today, he's playing in center field, and in his first at-bat, he made Alec Marsh throw a nine-pitch walk. 
Could it be that Brandon has become more accustomed to center field and maybe Mendoza should think about playing him in center more? Not sure what it means for Bader, but we know his gold glove would be good anywhere in the outfield. Of course, small sample size, but something to keep an eye on. Uh, I put nothing into that. If you come back to me in July and we see obvious differences, even then I'd be skeptical. I I don't think where he plays center or left is making a difference on the way he plays. Uh, small sample size alert would be my warning, but that was good to see on Saturday. I love when Brandon Nimmo starts games by getting on base or just having long at-bats. Lucas writes, our guy Pete, finally, someone clearly, cleanly tried to break up a double play to score a run and keep first inning going in Saturday's game. Yeah, that's true. Isn't that the uh, inning? Yeah, Pete Alonzo had a little bit of a takeout slide after Brett Beatty hit that ground ball and it allowed the run to score. That is true. McNeil continues to jog to second as I've watched since this was brought up by John Boy. Can't wait till Uncle Steve pays Pete. So since John Boy did that video about the takeout slides, I, like every other Met fan, has been paying very close attention to it. I have seen Jeff McNeil apply a takeout slide. I did. I think it was, I'm trying to remember the exact game. I should have written it down. But when there was a bang-bang play at second, I did see him slide in. So now that we're paying attention, maybe we're noticing something very different, and that's when it's going to be a close play at first base. We are starting to see a few takeouts, like you mentioned, Pete. Now, there are some in which guys don't even try, but usually they're on plays in which it's not even close. It's not even, you know, anywhere close to being something that can impact the play. Fred Solomon writes, I'm sitting up in the 500s for Doc Gooden Day, and I'm appalled at the crowd. Maybe it's 60% full for the ceremony. I get the weather can change our plans, but this is Dwight freaking Gooden, the most electric pitcher in the history of this franchise, and we can't sell out the stadium. What does this say about our fan base? If nostalgia can't get people to come, what will? Absolutely sickened by the turnout today. And why is Brett Beatty sitting against the lefty? The kid can hit anyone so far. Give him a shot. I agree with you, especially when it means Zach Short's going to play. <laughs> if this was Mark Vientos, maybe it's a different discussion. Alvarez, who also sat on Saturday, I'm starting to think, as much as it annoys me, that he really is getting beat up behind the plate. Mendoza made that comment a few days ago because even on Sunday when Alvarez was back in the lineup, he didn't look great. So maybe they're just being extra careful with him. I would still DH Francisco Alvarez, especially considering they don't really have an every single day DH. Um, I think the Mets are going to have to win crowd-wise, and especially with the high prices like we talked about earlier. Like The only way to do it is to just win. Matthew writes, I recognize the fact that I should be grateful to have a shortstop as good as Francisco Lindor, but his need to be classified as a switch hitter is not only hurting his overall numbers, but costing the Mets wins. I do wonder what his slash line may look like if he's better if he's batting exclusively right-handed. His numbers over the last two seasons suggest that he and the Mets should at least be talking about it. What are your thoughts? Okay, so here are my thoughts, Matthew. No. And there are two reasons for this on why I'm not, let's abandon being a switch hitter. Number one, he had a bad year from the left side of the plate last year compared to the right side of the plate. That is not something we've seen throughout the rest of his career. That's number one. So is a bad year in which he also was not 100% as it was revealed after the year enough to say, hey, he's got to abandon being a switch hitter? Number two, he's not hitting this year, period. Like, yeah, he's been better from the right side and he's been anemic from the left side, but I guess I need to see more before I start to say, oh my God, he can't hit left-handed. And then here's the third thing that needs to be brought up. He has spent his entire career seeing right-handed pitching, batting left-handed. All of a sudden now, because we see this sample size of a year plus of him being a better right-hand hitter, we assume that batting right-handed against right-handed pitching, something he has very rarely done throughout his career, is all of a sudden going to be a benefit to him? I don't know about that. I think we've got to stick with it. I think we all just have to be patient. And it is much easier to be patient when you're winning. And right now, the New York Mets are winning. Can they keep that up? 
They're about to play another series with another team that's playing a lot better than any of us saw coming. I mentioned at the top of the pod, the Brewers are 10 and 4. The Tigers are 9 and 6. The Reds are 9 and 6. The Braves are 9 and 5. The Royals are now 10 and 6. So everybody they played has been a above 500 team. Well, guess what? They're about to play the Pittsburgh Pirates, and the Pittsburgh Pirates are off to a very, very good start. So, what are we looking for in this series? We got Adrian Hauser going on Monday night against the left-hander Martin Perez. Let me give some advice to Carlos Mendoza. Play Brett Beatty. Do not sit him against the left A. Jose Quintana will start game two, and Luis Severino will start game three in this series against the Pirates as the Mets look to win two out of three, which would get them to 500 before going out west to take on the L.A. Dodgers. That was my goal. I may have said it on the air about a week ago. Can you get to 500 at the end of this homestand and get to L.A. right at 500? Then hopefully you come back at 500. Not easier said than done. It will certainly be a challenge. So we'll see if the Mets can do that coming up against the Pittsburgh Pirates, in which there will be nobody in the stadium. So we talked about the bad attendance. Here's the good news. If you want to go to a game, go on SeatGeek. They're cheap. Uh, what games are you planning on going to this week? I am planning on being there for two or three games, Tuesday night and Wednesday afternoon. We don't have a show Wednesday, essentially, uh, because the Yankees play a three o'clock game. So we only have a 20 minute show. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to use an off day to not do a 20 minute show. <laughs> so you're not going to go on the phone live from city field. No, nah, no, nah, I'm going to treat it like an off day. I'm going to take a, my kid to the game, actually, believe it or not. And I then, am what pulling if, young Spence, who is three years old, out of school to go to a Met game. So that's awesome. that'll be fun. And what about um, any book signings this week? No book signings this week. Oh, okay. Taking a break. By the <laughs> way, somebody, I did, no, somebody I did, did come to me at City Field with a book and I signed it. So I guess I'm doing a book signing at any moment of any part of the day. Every week. Listen, I've gotten text messages from people like, listen, can I bring the book over to your house? Can you bring it to work and get it signed? So it's just going to happen <laughs> everywhere you go. How, now, what is the craziest thing that you have had to sign so far in a book? I think you're asking me this because there's an answer you want me to give. And I will give it. I will give it. There was a gentleman, I think his name was Jose, who came to the Astoria book signing and had a request. And that request was to go to the acknowledgement section and fix anybody I did not acknowledge. And he specifically said, Pete Hoffman and Chris McMonagall and Dove Kramer. Those are the three names Enzo, he said. Let's go. And Dove. So there is an autograph, but I took a picture of it, so I will send it to you, Pete. <laughs> but maybe maybe I'll tweet it out. That's what I'll do. I'll put it out. There you go. At Evan Roberts WFN, in which I signed the back of a book in which I acknowledge the greatness of Pete Hoffman, of Dove Kramer, and Big Mac Chris McMonagall, who, I, of course, I used to work with during the Carter and Roberts era, so. I would say that's the answer, Pete. Is that the answer you're looking for? That was the one I was looking for. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll be at my plan as of now. Of course, my wife can always veto this is to be at two of the three games. That's for sure. Against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, of course, email the pod anytime. The Rico B at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voicemail. The number to call is 725. Nice. I nailed it. 725-222-8699. Good or bad about the Mets or about us. Totally up to you. Of course, rate, subscribe, Rico Bronia. If you've been watching on YouTube, good job by Pete Hoffman. He has allowed us to make the Rico Bronia also a YouTube show. So good work by him. Two out of three. Put a smile on your face. The Mets win a series again. Thank you for listening, downloading, subscribing, all that. To Rico Bronia. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Rico Bronio podcast. It's amazing, isn't it? Make sure you download it now to keep it on you at all times. We hope you enjoyed this episode.